Good morning, everybody. Well, it's almost morning anyway. I've been up super early taking my brother to the airport. Welcome back to the big board. You don't need to hear about all the personal details, but who has a flight at 5.30 in the morning? Uh, hey, kitten. Looks like the cat might join us, so feel free to join us in, join us here, little kitty. Why am I looking at, why are you looking at a cup of coffee? The Italians are known for many things. They're known for uh, the creation of espresso. Hey, buddy. Want to come say hi? Yes, he's managed to earn uh, table privileges. This is how far I've slipped. Uh, <laughs> the Italians are known for... Now, see, I had a great spiel going for you. I was going to lead you into Waterloo 200 and talk you through the whole story of espresso and how that's one of the good things that comes from Italy and although you wouldn't expect it block war games are also another good thing that comes from Italy so that probably gives you an indication of what I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about Waterloo 200 today and funnily enough I still have not finished a game yet really really look at this in the die roller. What is your problem, dude? That's my... Ah, hey. Little dork. I guess we're going to have to do some remedial training with you. Hmm. Anyway. I wanted to talk to you about Waterloo 200 because... Despite the fact that I have not finished a game yet... Uh, so I can't necessarily speak to play balance... Or replayability I can tell you this I can tell you that the game is interesting enough that I have started it over several times to try and work out opening moves and responding moves for, for the French and the Allies and I have also hey, come on I have also uh, okay listen it's time, it's time it's all very cute but now it's time to go Sit on my lap, all right. Uh, you know, I'm playing through the third turn right now. In fact, I'll show you the board. Eh? Right, there's the board as, as it stands on uh, the first uh, the first impulse of the third turn, or second impulse of the third turn, I forget. But nevertheless, uh, I wanted to talk about this game because there's some things about it that are particularly interesting. And I think regardless of whether... The game you know, plays absolutely historically accurately, or in it, or, or lets you feel like you are in at Waterloo, uh, and uh, and or captures all of the detailed mechanics. This is not Labate, right? Or Labatai, or however you want to pronounce it. We're not measuring where the cannonballs are careening and how many steps are lost out of each individual battalion and things like that. It's not that game. This is a nice introductory war game. And one of the things that in the past that I've failed to appreciate for uh, with a lot of war games is that I just realized something. Uh, I took that photograph. Huh. Very cool. I didn't know. I didn't realize that was on the box until just now. Uh, that makes me happy. It makes me happy that people can uh, use the uh, use the artwork, that is some of the art that I create. That's very cool. So, uh, and you may wonder, uh, did I purchase this? And I actually, I did. Uh, so, we will um, we will make a note to Manuele and say, "Hey, I, I noticed my pictures on on your uh, on your box, just so I can feel good about me." Uh, let's see. So, let's get back to this. I'm sorry for being so distracted. It's super early. It's I don't know. It's five o'clock or something crazy like that. So. Uh, what we're doing here, what, the things that I, I, what I wanted to say was, there are aspects to this game that I think, if you were to you know, walk into wanting to play war games and you played this game, you would read the rules and be somewhat confused and a little bemused by them and not really perhaps get it, right? Uh, I found, and I was involved in the initial, some of the initial drafts of the rules, uh, editing anyway 
uh, for English and editing for uh, uh, just sort of, you know, clarity. Uh, the, the, the rules are kind of a mess I'm still. I still think that the rules are problematic. They don't really convey the cleanness and the easiness of the game. They make the game harder rather than easier. And I, I'm not going to explain all the rules to you. I'm not, you can watch some of the videos, I, I, but they're probably not very helpful either because I was learning as we went. But here's what's really cool about this game. You can walk into this game read the rules and assuming you understood how to play the game, you can play this game and go, well, that was a pretty interesting game. Uh, it's fast playing, it's kind of fun, and you get to see, uh, you get to make a lot of hard choices because of the your leaders, uh, the stars on the leader counters, right? You know, because as you use those, they don't come back. And you've got to make choices about when you're going to use those. And you've got to make choices about when you're going to use your tactical leaders. You know, when is the right time to use Uxbridge and use his combat value in you know, a number of different attacks? Should I do that earlier or later in the game? Click, cram, crunch, bash. Uh, so there's, there's that to it. You know what? I'm going to just... No, I was going to start again. Uh, that would be the second time I started again. And by the time I do that, that would be bad. So one of the things that is interesting about this game is the subtlety that comes into play with the counters. Red circles indicate a robustness and strength value. Uh, so you have three you know, three dots, three strength points if you want to look at it that way. But red means it takes three hits to reduce. Whereas uh, white means it takes two hits to reduce. And this particular unit takes one hit to reduce because it's black, right? So one hit here, two hits here, three hits here, two hits, two hits, one hit. So just, just with this unit, I can tell many things about their capabilities that are abstractions of strength, morale, uh, tenacity, true quality, and all sorts of different things by the, the number of dots they have. So I can also tell unit size, right? So let's see if we can find a big unit. Where's a big unit? Here's a big unit. It has five dots, then three, then two, then one, but all of a consistent quality versus something like this French unit here, which is four dots white, then three, then two, then one in black. And that makes that makes a significant difference, you know, in choosing which units are gonna do what. Sometimes you don't have a lot of choice because you've got to have use the guys that you know, where they are. But we can tell things about the different aspects of the formations and the different cores and the different divisions in those cores and what they were capable of at given points in time. And that's a level of detail and thought that's gone into the game that you probably don't appreciate as you walk into it, right? You're not just going to sit down and play this and go, oh yeah, okay, I, I'm a, unless you're a Waterloo buff, you know, you might have some, some issue with this Brunswick unit having three pips of a white pips of strength uh compared to i don't know uh, some other infantry infantry unit here uh halberts division here and yet only having four pips white pips maybe it should have had you know three red who knows unless you're some uh pro uh, waterloo pro you're not going to get it so i would love to hear from the waterloo pros and what they think about the, the 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 intrinsic detail of the individual units and whether they, you feel that they fairly react react uh, reflect the reality of the situation. So this is really kind of a hackneyed uh, broken up display. I think the cats have kind of distracted me here. So there's a lot in the a lot in this game that's subtle. The map is besides being gorgeous. It's subtle as well because the map has lots of little details on it that we just may not appreciate until we start playing. And we look at this here, whoops, 
And we go, okay, yeah, well, that's an area, all right, but it's an area that's gold. And so we know because it's gold, it can only have two units from each side in it. And we know that it's going to have a different movement rate to move into it. And we know that it's going to have a different defensive value because of the shield and the, the number on that shield. You know, five is better than zero. So we know we, we can intrinsic, we're just looking at this at a glance. I don't need to look at a terrain chart or anything like that. I know that this particular locale is going to have a high value, high defensive value. But I also can see in the gravel pits right here, let me just zoom out a little bit, the gravel pits, that this has two units uh, stacking capability and a defense of three. And right behind it, I can, uh, right behind the gravel pits at this road junction here, a defensive value of three, but it's green. So it, it can hold four units and they both have different movement rates to move into them. And as you play the game, you'll look, start appreciating, oh, okay, well, it's gonna cost me two movement points to move into this area, but I also need to pay another one to uh, execute a combat, et cetera. So now I've gotta have, I'm not, I've gotta be adjacent to that uh, with infantry or one, one area away uh, with cavalry. So being able to pull, pull your forces into the right positions, you, uh, is important. You're going to look for certain areas on the map, and I'm actually not going to point them out because you, you need to explore them and find them for yourself. But there are areas in the map where you can activate a leader. Let's say uh, we've got a, a, an artillery unit here, and let's. Well, where is a leader? I think one of these guys has a leader. Yep. Uh, I've got an artillery unit here and a capital, uh, uh, a leader here. If I've got uh, a combat going on, or I want to have a combat, a combat over here, and I want to have a combat over here, this is clearly a really good place to be because these, this artillery and this leader can be used in both attacks. And in fact, if I had activated three leaders in the turn, I could act. A, I could have three attacks going on three different areas if I was in the right spot. I can use his combat values and this unit's combat values in those three offenses in that given impulse for the turn. So where your leaders are, where the artillery are, what the, or how you conduct the offense, how you structure the offense, where you begin it and where you end it, and how you support the units once they're in the, un in the locations they've acquired is all going to matter. It's all going to have uh, an impact on how the rest of the game plays. And Generally speaking, because there's no dice in the game, you can, very quickly you can tell whether or not you're going to be successful in trying to acquire a, a particular area. And to me, there's some element of, okay, well, I'm not going to be waiting for that 1 in 12 uh, of 2d6, excuse me, die roll, or 1 in 10 chance of a d10, then I'm going to get that result I need to capture you know, the chateau over here, for instance. I know because I've attacked here and failed, I know that there is no way that I can now, at the in the third turn of the game, that with this force and supporting units, there's no way really that I can bring enough force to bear to take this location at this stage in the game until or if I can acquire this location as well. And really, the reason why this leader was over here was because we were going to try and use him to add value to this, this combat. But we have to clear this first. So, there's a, there's a, this uh, lack of dice really drives some very hard practical decision making. That's really kind of refreshing and kind of nice. And I, and I kind of dig it. Um, Right, so there's that. Uh, let's see, what else? There were, was one thing on the board that I would say that I don't like about the board. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the two different fonts on the, the morale track here. It has this, and I forget the name of that font, but it's like a Comic Sans almost, I want to say. Uh, it, there's, so there's multiple fonts on the, on the board. There's multiple fonts for the numbers on the board. These... This turn track, these numbers should be facing the other way. They should be facing in so that I can see the numbers across this way and have the units across the bottom or the top, whatever, but they're facing out. 
and I don't think anyone's going to be sitting here. So you're looking at things upside down. Very minor point. Got the time time across the, the top here as well, which is nice. I'll zoom in there so you can see that a little bit. Uh, so that's probably the only quibble I have with the with the board. With the board. Uh, I'm not sure about the color coding here on the on the rail track. I don't know that that was necess necessary. Given how rich and vibrant all the colors are on the board and the palette that's used on the board, I don't know that you need this kind of graded color scale from healthy to sudden death uh, on the on the map. I think to me it kind of detracts from the overall aesthetic of the of the map and the pieces. Something more muted might have been nice. Anyway, so I wanted to share these initial impressions with you. I do, I will be continuing to play. I've got to put these pieces back where they belong roughly. Uh, I've got to get the Prussians on the board and we haven't done that yet. In fact, they're, they're about to, uh, about some of them are about to enter this turn. So we'll do that. I'll probably have some follow-up thoughts on play balance at some point, but I'll, I'll just say that I really do enjoy the level of effort that's gone into the game. I think component-wise, it's probably one of the best war games I've manhandled, um, best block games that I've manhandled in a long, long time. Uh, better than any of the other block games in the series. I probably still would like to see larger blocks and larger stickers, but everything is very readable and clear and concise and uh, pleasant and pleasing to the eye. Larger blocks would mean a larger map here. So I, I would be, you know, I don't know that I want a larger map than this for an introductory level game. So... I understand the choices that were made here and it's, you know, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous, it works well, the system is clever, interesting and innovative and subtle and thought provoking and requires some uh, aching choices that need to be made for both sides as you get into the game and get into the flow of the thing. So really, really well done, I can't, tell you how nice the box is despite the photographs on the side of it uh, what's on the back there we go so that is not one of my photographs but uh, the back of the box also is a great little uh, piece of sales uh, collateral for you as well so you could look at this and understand exactly what it is you're buying and what you're buying into Lots of uh, lots of good details on the box and beautiful sturdy uh, uh, laminate, not laminated, uh, uh, high gloss, beautiful box, great artwork, fantastic fun. So I think it's priced reasonably well as well for for that matter. So anyway, not not a review, just uh, my impressions from goofing around with this thing for a couple of weeks now, on and off in between other games. I've had uh, two failed attempts at getting together with folks to try and play this, but my, uh, my hope is that in the next week or so, I'll actually play this game with somebody uh, opposed, and we'll, uh, we'll kind of go at it from there. All right, talk to you guys soon.